And so the hate is real. And people want you to die. Because they get mad at their mediocre lives. You get one life. Make the best of it. I believe in you. Make the best of it. We can't have time to sit here, talk about this one and that. We got to work, man. We got to live our best lives ever. This is the biggest show. No bosses, no middleman, just me and you direct. So nobody can get in our stuff, get in our conversations. We talk how we want to talk. Yesterday was such an impactful show. Oh, let's get to it. My guess, my, my guess is on time. But of course, you're on time when you went for president of the United States. Like, you know, on time if he's going for mayor of New York City. Yeah, yeah, what? Andrew, yeah. You know, you know. Oh. Yeah, yeah, Andrew, it, it, this is a hip hop show. So my guests are usually late. So when you hit me and you say, yo, Joe, I'm here. I'm like, well, why wouldn't he be on time? This guy went for president of the United States. He went, he, he's going for mayor of New York City. The man got to be on time. That's right. Andrew Yang, punctual. <laughs> the Yang gang. So Andrew, uh, oh, shit. thank Sorry you. That. It's OK. It's a live show. It's a live show. Let's keep in mind. It was so hopping that it fell off the stand, man. You know, it's like it was so vibing that the phone was like, I cannot be contained. <laughs> Yo, Andrew, let me tell you something. You're a great man. Uh, a while back, you came on the show and you, you was doing something to give to the poor people. You was talking about it. Break down what you was doing at that point right there. Well, this is about a year ago today. Joe and people were hurting and uh, we had a little bit of money and so I said what's the best thing I can do right now uh, for New York and so we we get organization gave uh, a million dollars to a Bronx um, and we did to help people uh, but we also did it to try and kickstart its approach to what was happening with the pandemic said look we should be sending people money. Um, and, you know, it, it's one thing to say do something, and it's another thing to do it. And so I was like, let's just do it. Uh, so we did that about a year ago today. And then later, hundred bucks. And then much later, they sent another $600. And now we're at $1,400. Uh, it's always been to try and get money in hands, because that, that, that's the best way to lift people up a lot of the time. You know, Yang, I'm, I'm the same way. I try my best to give back, it's never enough. And I admire you for that, you know, actually taking it to the streets where I'm from, the Bronx, and giving out money back to the unfortunate or uh, to the less fortunate, right? And so, and, and, that, and that's, that, that's how my admiration for you started, right? Because I was like, here's a man who's giving back to the people. I feel the same way, I try to do the same thing. I know right? you. It's one reason why everyone loves you, man. You're like a very, very generous human. Thank God. And, uh, and, and so, to my understanding, they did, a, they did a, uh, uh, a chart. And they said, who would New York City vote for as mayor of New York City? And you came in first place. Is this what gave you the idea to run for mayor of New York City? Or was it always the plan? I know what you're talking about, Joe. So it was right after my presidential campaign ended, which was also a little bit more than a year ago today. And then someone ran a poll and said Andrew Yang would be the front runner if he decided to run for mayor. So I had a bunch of people reach out to me around that time saying, yo, man, run for mayor, run for mayor. <laughs> and, and it was incredibly invigorating and flattering um, because you know, ha having been here for 25 years, like, you know, it's a very high privilege for people to think of you that way. Um, at the time, though, I will say, I was like, I got to get Trump the fuck out of the White House. <laughs> That's really what I was thinking. Um, and so, you know, it's why it's why I ran for president in large part is like, I think I can get him out of there. 
Um, and so then, you know, a year ago today, uh, we did this cash relief effort in the Bronx to try and help people. Uh, but at the same time, I was like, I got to help Joe and Kamala win if I can. Um, and so my attention was on that for a while. Um, but people have been after me to, to, to run uh, for mayor. And I realized uh, last year that I was like, oh, my gosh, they're right. Like, I need to run for mayor in New York City because I think I can do a world of good. Um, so I'm thrilled to be in the race now. And when you talk about this chart that shows I was in the lead a year ago, I um, I'm happy to say that a, a poll came out like that last week that showed I'm in the lead right now. Like, in yeah, is it a good thing being in the lead, uh, in the lead or is it good? <laughs> like, I don't know, because you're in the lead. And so when I talk to other politicians, they're like, hey, nobody leads forever. Ever. And, and is there something wrong with being in the lead in, in, in a poll? Or, or I would feel good being in the lead. Like, is, is there something wrong with that? You know, Joe, I was actually going to make a hip hop reference. Like, if you're like the top of the chart, you're like, happy to be there, or you're like. Yo, I, close that door, please, Ted. I'd, um, I'd rather be at the top than not at the top. Um, yeah, you know. I like to be at the top, too. I mean, there's nothing higher than number one. Um, what, what, what are the changes? Because I, cause I drove recently through Manhattan, and one of my favorite avenues to drive through is Madison Avenue. And it's just so beautiful, and you got Hermes and all the It's everything New York is about. And it was pretty much depressing seeing how many businesses closed down. And I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. I got a lot of friends from New York City moving down to Miami. They depressed. Like, what? what is your plan to bring the city back, the heartbeat, the vibe of New York City, the small businesses back? I'm a numbers guy. A lot of people know that, Joe. Um, so when you looked at Madison Avenue, what you saw was that we're missing 60 million tourists and mm. kind of commuters. So if you get rid of all those tourists and all those commuters, all of a sudden, who's going to at Hermes or any of those Madison Avenue stores. Mm. So the stores, a lot of them have closed. Um, they're hoping to be open at some point. And so when you ask how are we going to get the heartbeat back, it's about getting back to commuters and tourists. Now, the tourists will come back when they've been vaccinated. Uh, that, that's the truth of it. The vaccine now, I would say, has been distributed more broadly here in New York. We're already seeing it. Like, I've had a number of meetings with people where they frankly acted like, you know, they, and they didn't worry about COVID. And so I was like, oh, what's going on here? And they would say, I've been vaccinated. And then I was like, oh, wow. Like, I've been having more and more of those kinds of meetings. More and more people get vaccinated. More and more companies would say uh, they're open for business. Uh, Broadway is going to reopen later this year. The city's, uh, in, the city's offices are going to be open, which will be a very, very big sign for companies. I CEOs of companies saying we're going to get the workers back, and so when those things start happening, they see more foot traffic, or uh, the small businesses frankly have a real like you got to get the foot traffic in the business back for any business owner to look up and say, well, maybe I should give it a shot and reopen because I'm going to have some customers to have some business. Uh, the other big issue is getting some of these small business owners relief on their rent um, because if you look at like right now, that, that's actually the big weight hanging over their head. Like if you are a storefront or a restaurant or a bar trying to decide whether to reopen, you're like, wait a minute, like, I, I always, like can I be on a monthly basis? And so you need to have like a, a settlement or like a way to get relief from the rent that they owe. Um, in regards to the public school system, to me it's real racially divided uh, the black and brown uh, have terrible quality schools. Uh, we can blame it on, on different things, but how is the richest city in the world have such a poor public school system? What you're going to do to get that jumping and make it a better public school system? 
Well, Joe, I think we need to give teachers and administrators the ability to help our kids uh, to a higher degree. And right now we're tying their hands very often. I've got one son in public school here in New York City. My older son is in a special needs. Uh, and I'm all about for the teachers more because they know our kids better than anyone but us. You know who doesn't know our kids as well? Some administrator, like a building or a boardroom, like, you know, miles away. Um, and so the way to improve offerings for our kids, particularly the kids in minority communities that, as you're suggesting, have not been well served by our school, is to let our teachers and administrators uh, establish enrichment programs or special needs programs or whatever our kids need in schools, and also try and invest in technical, vocational, and apprenticeship programs uh, at the high school level, because a lot of kids are up and our school system is not really relevant to them. We have this kind of industrial era school curriculum. Every kid, like, they're going to go to college when, frankly, college is not the right fit for kids. Uh, so what we need to do is, I, I don't know, Joe, you're looking at me. You have some of this. <laughs> no, I mean, could you close that door, my brother? Close that door. Yeah. You know, I'm a firm believer. I had a whole argument with my family last week about college. I feel like college prepares you for a glorified job. And uh, unless it's about being a doctor or a lawyer or something really, really specific, um, it doesn't teach you how to be an entrepreneur and be, how to be a boss. And I feel that way about the whole entire school system. I mean, I never really went, what did Paul Revere teach me? What did the Tea Party teach me? And so we got these kids in school, they're locked down, whether they're in Zoom or they're, and they're there all day and we force them to go to these schools and we tell them, no, this is, but it's really not teaching them or preparing them to be bosses or working in the workforce. And I, and I know that's probably even bigger than a mayor's job. I, I think it's a whole, United States institutional job. Like, they have to revamp the system and prepare our students for, for the future in real life. Not, you know, that, that stuff. Well, I, I couldn't agree with you more that this is a national challenge, but it's incredible how much we can do right here in New York City, Joe. I mean, we've got a, a school system with a million kids, uh, and then we've got this massive public university system in the form of CUNY, um, and all the other uh, campuses here in the city. Uh, and there are a lot of kids, you probably know a bunch of them actually, um, who have just been you know, in New York City public schools and then go to CUNY and like, there's a lot of good we can do. And uh, one of the challenges is going to be to try and plug more kids into opportunity, not, you know, frankly, like post-college, but in my mind, fresh full summer, where you're like every freaking opportunity trying to attach them to an organization that wants them to work. Um, because when I was growing up, my first job was a Chinese restaurant. I was a busboy, not a waiter, because my Chinese is to translate orders to the kids. So I had to do that, and they were just like, <laughs> like, you know, and, and like to do with what I'm doing now, it's like I mean, you could debate, like, say, you know, like I learned this job. And my next job was like selling knives door to door. And then my next job was filing clerk. Like we need to get kids into environments where they're getting any kind of exposure, a little bit of money, <laughs> like, like just being around organizations that are, you know, like asking them to deliver and like, uh, and, you know, on a daily basis. Um, I think that's where we learn and develop. And schools are really not. Um, schools right now are these kind of factories and they do this and, and it's very much like yes, no, right, wrong. Um, and I mean, when you talk about trying to learn to be a boss, I mean, you know that what you need more than anything is like people skills, judgment, the ability to like, you know, build relationships and like, uh, like you know, like find the right people to like compliment you. I mean, that's the kind of stuff you're not learning in school eight times out of ten. Um... You know, uh, 
people are saying your 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 your, your voice is going in and out. Oh really? I'm sorry about that. I don't know if it's uh, it, like my my connection might not be the greatest. It is Instagram. I'm sorry. Case. <laughs> um, if it keeps on, maybe we'll click off and click back on. Yeah. We... A, a very important things. Um, I got to talk to you about on here, and I just think overall they should be prepared for the workforce or to be entrepreneurs. I think we have tons of kids with bright ideas that uh, pretty much by forcing them in the current school system uh, takes away, you know, everything comes from imagination. Everything comes from creativity, you know, and we don't allow our kids to be creative or use their imagination, you know, and, and so <clears throat> I really, I really, you know, have a problem with the whole school system. As far as uh, okay, we might have lost my man. Oh no, we we just tried to fix the connection. So hopefully, I'm better. Am I better now? I don't know if it's better. I mean, you, you was good to be, but the people they don't lie. So when they say, yeah, no, no. <laughs> that's what I'm trying to, to you know. Uh, like, I agree with you, Joe, like, we're not letting kids actually think bigger, become creative, uh, be imaginative. And you know, the first thing that gets cut when the budgets get tight, arts, drama, music, like all of that is considered like the, the extra stuff. But I'm a data guy. And the data says that arts education is actually some of the most effective in terms of engaging kids and making them more excited about uh, you know, like moving forward in school, frankly, uh, it gives them more confidence. It gives them the ability to express themselves. Um, so art should be the last thing to go, not the first. Uh, if, if I am fortunate enough to be the mayor in this city, I'm going to invest more in arts and music and creativity at the high school level because I think that just prepares our kids, especially because the economy, frankly, is making it so that a lot of book learning is less relevant because we all have smartphones and you're going to have computers doing a lot of that stuff you know it's like like the factory model is is serving us worse and worse um what was the light bulb that went off in your head and you said i have to be mayor of new york city what 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 what, what was it for you that you said i have to run i want this job i want to represent the city it was late last year, Joe, and I was talking to people uh, about the mayor's race and the role and the job. Uh, and they gave me a sense of both just how badly our city, uh, frankly, um, is doing right now. Like, it's real, we're not in good shape. I mean, you said it before. It's like, there, there are massive, massive problems. And then they gave me a sense of how much good the right mayor could do. And that was enough when I was like, okay, we're in a crisis. And I can do a lot of good um, because I'm just going to have the most positive impact I can for the most people. Uh, and so being able to help 8.3 million people have a better way of life, like that's, you know, that's a freaking, you know, like no one could ask for more. Um, so, so that's what got me excited and on board. And now I'm even more excited to be running because I'm learning uh, about different uh, neighborhoods and communities every day and like uh, what people struggle with are and how Yeah, a uh, big, big disconnect in our community with the police and, and, and the black and brown. And, you know, it was a famous day last year. It was COVID. Everybody was locked in the house, quarantine. They showed uh, people in the village, downtown, uh, the police were giving them masks voluntarily. And then we were seeing kids uptown getting slammed to the ground by the police. So what, you know, this, this, this you know, you stepping into something like, like, and it's, it's not your fault. It's been going on for a long time, but what, what, what do you, what's your plan to release tension between the police department and the people uh, of New York? Well, the, the first thing you have to do is you have to acknowledge the NYPD has a culture problem. 
And so when you look at it and say, okay, you've got a culture problem among tens of thousands of officers, how do you change it? Uh, you need different leadership at the top with someone who's from a different culture. Uh, if you employ someone who's frankly of the NYPD or police culture, like why would you expect to change uh, significantly? So I've committed to hiring a civilian police commissioner who's not an NYPD product mm. now. Uh, because if you're going to change culture, it has to start at the top. Another thing I've, I've suggested that I think would help is that new police officers should live in New York City because then they would understand the communities that they're serving and protecting uh, more immediately. Uh, and you would have folks who then, and we already require this of employees of other city agencies that frankly are not as big as the NYPD. <laughs> it's like if you work for X agency, it's like I live in New York. But right now, most cops live in uh, Long Island, Jersey, uh, or someplace outside of New York City. Um, and so if you bring them into New York City, then they'd have like just a deeper understanding um, uh, of what's going on. <laughs> It's almost like a politician. It's, it's almost like if you're from the Bronx and you're the Bronx Borough President, you got to live in the Bronx. Sure. You, yeah. Urban you know, the one time, there. you know, you know, I've been at the hand of racism a lot of times, but the one time I ever heard it, like, legitly, like, I couldn't believe it. Like, I was like, oh, my God. I was hanging out with a friend of mine who's very, very famous, and a couple of his friends. And we went to like All-Star Weekend uh, baseball. And we were having the best time. I hung out with these guys all day, right? And as we're walking towards the hotel, this one guy says, yo, I got to go back to these cockroaches tomorrow. And I'm like, so I'm like, what do you mean? And he's like, no, nah, I'm a police. I'm a police officer and, and I watch the housing department in uh, Coney Island. They should rip down all these buildings and get rid of the cockroach. I could not believe this, Andrew. Like, I heard it with lyrics, right? So I look at this guy, I said, man, you calling human beings cockroaches? Yeah, and he said, and he said a couple of other things. I was happy I heard it because you can assume what you want, even though I didn't assume this of these guys, but to hear it, um, I was like, wow, so these are the cops that patrol our neighborhoods and they deep down inside when they're comfortable call us cockroaches. What, one thing we should do is audit the NYPD for white supremacists. Because uh, if you have white supremacist cops, that, that's going to result in something truly awful uh, and tragic before long. Um, and that, that's a real problem in frankly, a lot of police forces and military organizations. Uh, so that, that's something that we should undertake immediately. I mean, every law enforcement. So, so we force. honestly believe this ain't just a bullet point or what we call, uh, what you call a clickbait. We honestly believe there's white supremacists within not just the New York City, but in other police departments. Well, it's verified fact that there's a growing problem in various um, and you know, in my big organization, not to have this. You know what I mean? Like, if, if you're looking at a police force of a very significant size or a military force of a very significant size, right now the presumption would be that um, you have to be very vigilant against a white supremacist element. That uh, uh, like terrified problem in um, military circles. Man, that's that that's scary, but it's it's it's, it's very real. It's 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 it's, it's very real. Uh, I'll uh, jump off that subject. Opportunity to say to to everyone, you guys. I've been friends with Joe for years, and I just want to say that Joe has love in his heart for everyone uh, of every background. And that's <laughs> Are you referring to the rap? Uh, the rap. Not. Let me tell you something, Andrew. Yo, I love. I have hundreds and thousands of Asian, Asian brothers and sisters. I know I'm it. I'm not lying. No, I know it. I mean, I I've love been, them all. I've been friends with you for years and like, you Let me know. tell you something, Andrew. I've never went back. I'm a freedom of speech guy. I never went back on a lyric one time in my life. This is the first time because the Asian community have been so beautiful to me. I've been, 
such beautiful people to me. I've never met a bad one in my life. And so to think that I might upset one that don't know me personally, or don't, I said, oh no, I gotta fix this, correct this immediately. Like this, you know, because these people are so beautiful to me, right? Um, but now that we're talking about Asian hate, you know, you told me something interesting one time where you said, you believe that even if Donald Trump didn't start the China flu or the Kung flu or whatever, that, that this would still be going on. I do think that, Joe. Uh, I mean, I would say that he definitively made it worse and more acceptable and more mainstream uh, and spread it uh, more widely. But there's been racism against Asians since well before Donald Trump uh, became president. And there would have been manifestations in this direction, even if Trump was not inflaming it um, over this past number of months. He definitely made it worse. Like I, I you know, I uh, railed against his use of various terms at uh, the time. Um, but I do think pinning it on Donald Trump is uh, frankly giving him a bit too much uh, Credit? Yeah, I was going to credit. I mean, you know. It's not you know what happened to me? And we're going to stay on this subject, Andrew, but 9-11, right? 9-11 happened. My brother, Full Flex, he's, he's passed. But he called me, look at the TV. I lived in Jersey right over the, the water. So as I'm looking at TV, I, I go outside. I see the second building fall. I lived right across the, the Hudson River. Craziest day of my life. The first person I called when they said that those guys was Muslims was my best friend, DJ Khaled. And I called him and said, are you all right? He said, yeah, why? He was all the way in Miami. I was like, don't come outside. Don't come out your house. Don't, because I had fear of what 9-11 was that they would retaliate against all Muslims, cab drivers, you know, good people. You know, good people. And, and, and so they painted this picture like COVID-19 came out of uh, China and, you know, they, they, they playing with this hate. And that's got to be the same type of worry you're going through for your people. Yeah, Joe, the energy was different starting about 13 months ago in February where I would walk around and you would just get like a different type of reaction from people as frankly, like a, you know, an Asian dude in a mask, like walking the streets of New York. Um, and that there was like a, a different level of animosity uh, or uh, flinching or shying away from you in public if you're sitting on the subway. Like, and, and so when you feel that, uh, you, at first, you're trying to make excuses in your head. You're like, well, maybe, you know, maybe that was a person, maybe it's in my head. But now I've talked to dozens of people. I talked to one Asian, uh, Asian woman who's literally been punched twice by two different people, like on the streets of New York. I heard that and I was like, that is insane. Uh, where like the, the level of uh, threat uh, of assault that Asian Americans feel on the streets of New York is very, very different over this last 13 months than had ever been the case before. So I agree with you. It, it is somewhat analogous to what the other obviously her experiences. Now I know. Now I, now I know. Out of all places, it's weird that it happened down in the South and in Georgia, and we know the South is the South. But why do you think? The police refused to call it a hate crime. What happened with, with the people that got killed in the spas? Why won't they call This is an obvious hate crime. Um, have you given that any thought? I think their incentive is to try and minimize this. Um, though I agree with you, it's completely obvious to anyone that this is a hate crime. And what I've said to folks... You kind of know who's going to be behind those doors when you open them. Uh, and 
uh, in this case, these women were clearly prohibited uh, because of the um, and, and I total madness to ask a 21-year-old murderer what his motivations were and then tries a person clearly uh, disturbed. So you should just call it like you said, and in this case, it's clearly a hate crime. I can't speak to why they're, they're motivated to frame it as anything else, except perhaps that it uh, makes their, their uh, institution easier or more straightforward particular way. I'm not sure. I will say that in New York City, there have been some incidents that should have been called hate crimes that were not. Right? And, uh, and if you want to be about this, hate crimes are defined by the intent of the person. Um, and so, like, you know, you can, uh, you have to say, well, like, did the person do or say something that clearly demonstrates that uh, the person was racially targeted? Um, though in some cases, like the Atlanta shooting in my mind is just so patently obvious, like the action speaks for itself. Like I knew it, I knew it when it happened. Um, I said, damn, right? And then you always want to know who's behind it, right? And so like with the mass shooting in Denver, the last thing I thought was they was going to say he's a Muslim. And you know, my best friend's Muslim. My, you know, some of my best friends are. And when they said that, I said, damn. Like, damn, man. Like, why? Right? And and so um we I I I, I just don't understand when it is what it is, right? Because we, we I mean, it's outrage in the Asian community all over the world. They kill Asians. You know it's a hate crime. I just don't get why you don't charge the man as a hate crime, right? And this guy too, I don't know what this guy was motive was, but they talking, I'm sure it's mental illness, but he's you an know, animal. You know the other thing, Joe, that's frustrating to a lot of people, I know a lot of people watching this know this, that when you have a mass murderer background, you need to get arrested and fall safely into the hands of the and then when you have someone with another background, they get dozens and dozens of times. And you, you look at it and you're like, how the heck is this person getting arrested? And like, you know, frankly, like being put in a position where we're like asking about what the heck is going on with them. When you know that if the person looks this other way, like they'd be shot dead and they're like, you know, like, like no one would be delving into their motivations. Now that's a, that, that, you know, I don't want to turn this into a big racial thing, but you know, I was with my wife today. I mean, not my wife, my mother today. And, and the minute they said, hey, it may be mental illness, my mom was like, if he was black, he'd be a monster, he'd be an animal, he'd be, he'd be a criminal, you know? And I said, Ma, it's 2021, relax. <laughs> you know, because he's old school. But ain't it the truth? Like, it, you, you, we can all see that there are very different standards being applied uh, to different types of people where law enforcement are concerned. Uh, you know, it, it's just a painful truth. Um, it's something I hope to change in New York City uh, if I'm fortunate enough to be our next mayor. I like, I like the concept of uh, the civilian running the police department. And because it's not realistic either way. Do in the military already. We have like a civilian head of the military in part for the same. Wow. And so, and, but because, because when, when, when the 10 guys, 10 people got killed yesterday, when they say it was a police officer, father of seven, I felt bad. And I have my issues with the police, but he's a hardworking man. He ran in there to save lives. Call it what it is. He's a hero. Yes. Like, not too many people could do that. So God bless him. God bless his family. We're not just here bashing the police officers. But often, when there's questionable things that go on in New York City, these guys, the leaders of the, of the, of the police union, this one guy, right, I don't know his name, but he almost seems to like, there is no way in the world it's going to be the cops' fault in life, in history, 
Did the police do something bad? I've never seen this guy. I guess you could call him the most loyal cop in the world. Well, part, part of it, Joe, is you have an organization and the organization's purpose is just to fight for um, its members. And so, you know, like you will, you never will see them say, hey, like maybe our guy, um, you know, screwed up on this one. Is that, that's just not the purpose of their organization. Um, you know, like, uh, and, and that's one of the problems we're facing, which is that people who are put in positions where frankly, it's their job to like take on a certain position, then there is no balance. There's no uh, like uh, examination of this particular situation relative to others. It's like, well, it's job to freaking, uh, you know, fight for a particular point of view. Um, and so, you know, like expecting that person to be balanced is frankly going to work. Like the, the best thing we can do is try and balance that organization's uh, pull, uh, you know, with a process that actually, you know, counterbalances what the public's interest is. Um, I, and I agree with you that, you know, obviously that cop was a hero. Tried to take five, uh, like that, there are a lot of, and, you know, and I've also said, look where uh, this violence against uh, Asians is concerned, like, you know, we should fund by, uh, an anti-Asian hate crimes task force in the police, because if you have, like, you need the police. Like, you know, I, I'm someone who will say, like, you know, we're going to need the police to solve some of these problems. You know, of, of course, right? You know, police officers saved my son's life one time. I was visiting my mom's. He was choking on a candy. It was a, a young lady. I was running across the street. I guess she saw I was d desperate. If I put my son in the car and drove to the nearest hospital, he would have suffocated and died. She said, what's wrong? I said, he suffocated. She did the Heimlich to save him. This is a true story. I mean, we need police officers. You know, everybody says defund the police, but I, I agree with the concept of if there's somebody who has mental illness or has a domestic violence, send a social worker in there to talk them out of it. They haven't had their medicine, but we need police. Like, so, you know, I, I don't know who doesn't, think, I don't know if somebody thinks we can walk around New York City without police. That's not gonna happen. Um, final question, my brother. What are we gonna do to bring the economy of New York City back and thriving? I know you alluded to soon as everybody's vaccine, the tourists to come back, they'll spend money. What, what are other uh, creative and innovative ideas you have to bring back the economy in New York City? Uh, I love this question, man, because it's the focus of not just my campaign, but what's gonna happen afterwards. So I'm an operator, I'm an operator, I'm gonna try and take the problem in turn. But number one is you're missing 84% of commuters. So how do you get people back to the office? You have to go to organizations and say, look, bring people back to the office and we'll provide incentives to help you do something. Now this is gonna sound wild to people, but I think we should give folks, let's call it a gift certificate to a New York City restaurant if they're commuting back into the city five days a week, um, because that'll be an incentive then Right now, they might commute zero days, two days, three days. It's like, if you commute five days, we're going to give you a gift certificate to a New York City bar or restaurant. You can use it wherever you want. And then the restaurant or bar can, like, redeem with the city. Like, this is going to be a way that we can kickstart getting people back in. I called for a subway fare holiday the entire week of Memorial Day just to get people riding the subway again and also get people in from, um, from the suburbs to say, hey, you know what? New York City subway is free for a... a Let's go explore because we can get in and then we can ride around. We can check out different neighborhoods and get on and off and care about the, the money involved. We're going to have the big post-COVID comeback five boroughs celebration to let people know that the city is open for the images that people are getting on social media without the pay for us to do so. You're going to be invited to perform. I hope you do. You mean you have a lot of fans? Like we're gonna, uh, like I'm gonna Dave Chappelle the headline. Um, you know we've got we're gonna have like a giant party to let people know that New York City is the place to be, and that you can visit and have a great time. You know uh, like shows, concerts, events. So uh, I've got big plans, and I'm gonna let people know that there are things going for us, and people might not be. Thanks to the Democrats and Chuck. 
where we've got billions of dollars in federal aid that's coming our way uh, right to New York State. So we're going to have uh, something to work with. We know we have to deploy those resources in a way that helps small businesses reopen. Um, one of my plans, some people are going to love this because this is up your alley. Um, so you've got some empty storefronts in New York City right now. Empty storefronts are not a good thing. If you are a restaurateur, you're looking at, or a retailer, you're looking at that storefront, okay. I might be interested, but there's no way I can commit to a five-year commercial lease. Who the heck knows what the next five years are going to hold? So what we're going to do is we're going to make it easy to open pop-up retail and pop-up restaurants with only a six-month or a nine-month or a 12-month commitment to just try and get some of those storefronts back open. And then if you have an existing retailer someplace else, you can just try out an outpost, very low risk. Uh, and for the landlord, we're gonna <laughs> right now we're getting zero. But like that empty storefront's bad for you. Too. So we're, we're going to lower the barrier to try and get the lights on for places so that when people do come into the city, the streets are filled with businesses they can check out. If you're in New York City, like we're all attracted to, frankly, things that are temporary. So if you know that you've got a pop-up restaurant in your neighborhood, you're like, oh, I got to check it out before it goes away. <laughs> and they'll be like a cool chef, the whole thing. So we're, we're going to, to try and create like a, a really straightforward way for restaurants and retailers to be able to actually activate some of these, um, these uh, storefronts. You know, DJ Camillo, who's one of the greatest DJs in New York City, said, how can we bring nightlife back? You know, uh, neighborhoods have been getting gentrified and they've been pushing out the nightlife. And so all the clubs and strip clubs and stuff like that, they've been disappearing. And there's a big push in Washington Heights because it seems like that's gonna be the next place to get gentrified. So all the moms and pops businesses are hollering about. So what do you think about uh, the gentrification of these neighborhoods? And how do we keep the true people who belong in these neighborhoods and give them opportunities to stay in their own businesses and stay in their neighborhoods. Well, you've got two separate questions. Let's start with the nightlife one first, because I'm really passionate about it. I want to put the night back in nightlife. Uh, I'm going to have a deputy mayor for cultural entertainment and nightlife. Uh, and nightlife is not like an extra nightlife. It's a defining element that makes New York City an appealing place to live for young people, which is key to our competitiveness. The way it works is that if you get young people who are talented and energetic in New York City, then organizations feel like they need to be here in order to employ those people. And those young people are attracted to nightlife. So we have to make it so that bars and clubs are very much uh, able to operate their thing. Um, and they should not be uh, kept from doing so by to move into those neighborhoods. Like I'm, I'm, I've got a development principle uh, around like pre-existing businesses in a community where if you are a club and you're operating and then your neighborhood and says, Hey, I don't like that you're operating. Like it's like, it's up to them to mitigate, like, you know, on their own, like, you know, the, the, the uh, ambiance of the club on their own because the club was there first. <laughs> you know what I mean? like, like that's one of the things <laughs> like, if someone moves to the neighborhood. Then, then Problem. Somebody moves into the neighborhood and looks at you. You've been living there 40 years. They're looking at you like, yo, where this guy come? Like, like, and you're looking at them like, huh, excuse me? Yeah, yeah. I lived here my whole life. What's funny is there's like a fancy principle for it, but like, you know, like I'll find the title, but like the, the basic idea is like, you know, you were there first. <laughs> so so that's one issue. Like, I genu like I'm so focused on nightlife. One thing you might not know about me, um, Joe, is that I was, a, I was a promoter in my 20s, my late 20s. Uh, through par parties under the name Ignition NYC. Uh, anyway, whatever. There's a. It, it was a. <laughs> oh, so you like the party? You like the nightlife? But I, it's right. You know, New York City. You come to New York City. You want to shop. You want to party. You want to go to the great restaurants. Uh, the thing is, the thing that's so beautiful about New York City is the diversity in cultures. I don't care if you came from Pakistan. There's a pa little Pakistan in New York. There if you came from Colombia, there's a little Colombia. There's a little India. There's a little uh, Chinatown. There's a, you know, and it's so vibrant. Um, and there's been such a big push to shut down the clubs and the nightlife. 
which I don't think they understand that uh, that how important it is to the city and the economy. And a lot of those clubs, Joe, are uh, independent small business owners. Like they, they are getting uh, priced out in various ways. And I'm going to make sure that they ha always have a place in New York City because I genuinely think that it's a key driver to our success. You know, and, and it doesn't even show up directly in the numbers or even the numbers directly. Like a lot of people work in the nightlife industry, you know, like tens of thousands. So it's a, it's a job generator intrinsically. But then if you look at the impact on culture and the attraction to young people, it's actually, uh, you know, worth much, much more than you can even determine in like the direct economic impact. Um, so life is going to have a friend in me. Live music is going to have a friend in me. The fact is that a lot of these businesses uh, were struggling pre-COVID. Like live entertainment is a tough, tough business. Um, and if, if we're uh, going to retain a lot of those businesses, the city needs to, to invest resources in many cases. Like even if you say, hey, do your thing, like I think they're going to need some more help than that. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Yang. Thank you so much. Uh, good luck. Keep doing Thanks. your thing out there. Anyone watching this wants to support, you can go to andrewyang.com. We love your support. Let's get the city we love back on its feet. The election's on the 22nd. It's like less than three months away. Let's do it. Boy, you got hyped like you just heard some public enemy right now, Andrew Yang. <laughs> I've always got something playing in my head. <laughs> God bless my brother. I love you. Good luck, okay? Love you too, Joe. Thank Be you. Good. I'll see you at this giant party we're going to have at the latest. All right, my brother. Bye-bye. So there you have it, the one and only Andrew Yang. The Yang gang was in attendance. And so we have Fernando Mateo on here, running for mayor. My guy, Isaac Wright Jr., running for mayor. We got Andrew Yang. And so you don't know who I know. You right, <laughs> yo, Camillo. <laughs> You don't know who I know, but that was an excellent question, DJ Camillo. And so <clears throat> this whole show is about talking about stuff that matters in our community. Uh, great guy. Anybody goes out there before he was running for mayor and feeds the poor people and give them checks. And that, that's my type of guys. Some people get rich and they run away and you never see them again. Those are my type of guys. New York Nico. Love this guy, man. <laughs> I ain't know you was tuned in, Nico. But how do we bring New York City back? Okay. How do we bring New York City back? Because we're in bad shape right now. And so we need to appreciate our city and stand up. And uh, so shout out Andrew Yang for checking in. Tomorrow night, beautiful, I'll say a beautiful interview tomorrow on the Big Big Show. Tomorrow night I got somebody I admire and she is very beautiful. Uh, she's a legend on the screen. A legend. Her roles are impeccable. And so uh, it's going to be really, really, thank you, New York, Nico. It's going to be really, really incredible tomorrow. I've been looking forward to this. Uh, the whole week is going to be amazing. What you want me to tell you? This is the biggest show in the game. What you want me to do? It's the biggest show in the game. Nobody's even close. Don't let them lie to you. And they try to lie. People hate so much. They mad at themselves. And when you're doing good and you're out there working and feeding your family and having a great time, they're so mad at you. I wonder why. What would make another human being mad at somebody who's successful, who comes from where they come from? who struggled the same oppressions as them. It does not make sense to me, man. And so the hate, people mad at themselves. 
So they, sometimes I hear sick stuff that I'm just like, it's unbelievable. Thank you, Smitty. It's unbelievable that people have the time to concoct ideas and think ill will of other people they don't even know. And so you on the end, you showing them you having a great time and they mad at you somewhere. Somebody's mad at you. Give a lot, said it, George. Probably the best guy I ever met in Miami in my life, George. Golf Lickers. So let me tell you, jealousy is a disease. They do need God in their life. And it's terrible, man. And 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 this is the biggest show on earth. You're never gonna meet a guy like me talking this real stuff. It's not going to happen. And because you know why I realized I said, you know what, man? Every time somebody tried me, all these other hip hop journalist sites, they throw it up immediately. And I said, man, I've been good with these people for many years. I've been giving interviews to these people for so many years and give pouring my life out to them so they can make a couple of dollars big enough to journalists. And then I realized, I said, Joe, those guys got boss. Those guys, guys, they report you. You have no boss. You cut the middle man. We create our own media outlets. We cut the middle man. And so I'm like, now nah, I got to watch everybody, even the people I've been, because I'm like, damn, man, everybody mad. And so I come on here and, I talk, and I'm telling you stuff that no one will tell you. I'm telling you stuff that no one will tell you. I'm telling you how to lift yourself up. And I'm telling you that I've been through depression. I'm telling you that I've been, I fell. I opened businesses, lost, and started other ones. I'm not just up here fronting for you. We tell you the truth. My man came on yesterday, Michael K. Williams, Omar for the wire. He was like, yo, man, I was getting on. I was in the projects watching the wire, the show. That's real shit. But some of you are going through that and you need that. That knowledge. So you can rise. This is real shit. None of that mumbo jumbo shit these guys trying to do. This ain't mumbo jumbo. And so they scared of that. Because you finally got a guy talking the truth. Who don't have a boss. Who's doing just fine. He's doing just fine. And so, that's what is going on. And so let me take snapshots of whoever this is, because then they won't be allowed on here again. And so I, that, that's what I noticed too. I'm gonna tell y'all something. I'm very thick skinned, but somebody who come on the show all the time and talk shit, I'm gonna start taking pictures of them and just block them. Cause I don't need you. You ever heard of that? I don't need you to follow me. I don't need you to comment. If you're not trying to roll with us and be about the light and love, we don't need you. You've ever heard of that one? And so let me tell you the difference between me and other guys. These guys who does this type of thing, this is their only job. So you gotta walk on eggshells, they gotta, you know, they're scared to really talk the real what they really wanna say. You got some guys that run radio stations that really don't want to listen to the shit they playing. But they gotta play it. 
because they follow the analytics and that's what it is. Fuck it. Nigga. I do not have none of those issues. And so I'm going to tell you what's from my heart. Might be right, might be wrong. And here we tell you all the time, this is about love, this is about inspiration, this is about us being scared because of COVID-19. And we got on here together, my daughter's executive producer, and she put us on here and we all bonded together. We got through this period. I tell you all the time, I look at this as, good morning, Vietnam. And so, that's why. And I tell you all the time, let your darkest moments bring your most clarity. Let your darkest moments bring your most clarity. And put God first, man. And they try, the devil come. The devil come in all different ways and shapes and sizes. They try to bring you down. And happiness, happiness and health is the true currency. You are rich if you are happy. No matter what. You know, Cuba is a dictatorship. And so they don't have much stuff. And so you might go to Cuba and you see them cars from the 1940s and 50s. And they're all so beautiful. It is. But they just don't have it, right? But what you learn in going in Cuba is that even though those people never had it, they're very happy people. And so happiness is the true currency. If you're happy, you're rich. There is rich people watching this show right now, miserable, and I'm sorry to hear that. God bless you and I wish you happiness. But you could be anywhere in the world. You could be in Malibu right now in a mansion, miserable. And so whatever makes you happy, because you know what, it's your life. If you're not taking advantage of no little girls, if you're not uh, killing people, if you're not robbing people, then live your life. Whatever makes you happy, live your life. I had a conversation with somebody the other day and they said, uh, Joe, be real with me. What's up with the guy? He put the diamond on the head, 24 million, right? And I get it. I get what they saying. But I said, you know what? The man worked for his. And if he's happy, then I'm happy for him. Nah, but Joe, I, said, I wouldn't have put a $24 million diamond on my head. But guess what? That's what he wanted to do with his money. It made him happy. Happy birthday to that dad. My aunt turned 80 today. She looks so beautiful, Miriam. I see you. Well, you can be broke and be happy. Do you get what I'm telling you? Happiness is priceless. There's people rich that are miserable. You get it? Pretty Lou's on the check-in. Pretty Lou been fighting cancer for five years. Willis Ave Legend, what's up? Pretty Lou been fighting cancer for five years. Every time I call him, he smiles. He's happy. He's thankful. Joe, I want to do this show. Okay, you do a show. It's COVID out there, oh, Pretty Lou. I'm not showing up this year until things get a little better. But he wants to do it and he works and he has his own show on here. He got the DJs and he give it, he's happy. Whatever makes you happy. Now, oh uh, God, good times, bad times. They told, they throw all type of things at me. 
And guess what? I love God all the time. Because God has been great to me, great to my family. You know, you guys allow me to live my dream. You guys allow me to live my dreams out. You know, I was born just a kid in the Bronx. And I've been able to overcome all these fears and all these obstacles and been able to take care of my family. You guys have done that for me. And I'm forever grateful for that. But first is God. Don't lose sight of that. All right, y'all, the big.